Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am Win King Wong, MIT class of 84, founding president of the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. If you are part of the MIT community, please join our group for free. You don't have to be Chinese. Our online events are free and open to the public. If you are a member of the public, please link in with me and message me to be added to our invite list. Thank you to our sponsors, the MIT Club of New York and the first generation alumni of MIT. Today's topic is secrets to doing well in your professional career. We are excited to present Gorik Ng, Harvard BA and MBA. Gorik is a Harvard College career advisor. He specializes in coaching first generation, low income students. He is the best selling author of The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. Humphrey Chen is our moderator and board member. He is MIT class of 1990 and a Harvard MBA. He is also co-founder and CEO of Clipper. Here is Humphrey. Great, thanks very much, uh, Winking. Uh, you know, I think part of the reason that uh, our team you know put together this webinar and and the way that we've been viewing the education process for the MIT Chinese alumni of group is that you know we are many thousands of alumni around the world and we're all at different stages of life and we all graduated and some of us are at the beginning of work some of us are at the, at the middle of the middle of work some of us have already retired and what we realized is that there's a lot of things that we can all learn and if we want to make mistakes we should make new ones that other folks in our generation or in our alumni class haven't made before and so when the idea of bringing Gorik on board to help teach everybody how they can improve their career came to the table we were like this is perfect because there are so many rules that we have learned about in school about like what it takes to get an A what it takes to get 100 what it takes to get a 90 you know to be in the top three percent it's well defined at the at the workplace it's actually not well defined uh and and that's why like Gorick's title around unspoken rules means a lot of people end up learning things the hard way which means you make the mistakes and then you deal with the mistakes and then you try to avoid them again and you know so with that as kind of the backdrop we figured hey Let's invite Gorik. Um, and you know, for me, I'm class of 90, so I've experienced many of these uh, mistakes firsthand uh, and had to, learn, had to learn it the hard way. And our hope here is that even though the book was originally designed for people who are like right out of school or like starting your career right, we realized, hey, anybody can actually keep learning and improving in their career. Uh, and so our goal here uh, with setting that stage here is to, to, you know, let me hand it over to Gorik um, and uh, uh, begin teaching us the rules. Uh, and this will be like, you know, very educational. And the book, of course, is going to be the supplement. And then we'll unpack with some questions that I have in mind, uh, as well as a Q&A from, from the audience. So let me hand it over now to, to Gorik. Thank you so much, Humphrey. Thank you, Wing King. And thank you all for being here. Special thanks to the MIT Chinese Alumni Group, as well as the First Gen Club and Alumni Group of MIT. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know you're all busy people, and so for you to spend even just this next hour with me means a great deal. As Humphrey mentioned, uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. When I was first starting out, as I'll share shortly, I didn't have many of this advice and these strategies. And so my mission with not only tonight, but with my broader career is to democratize what I wish someone had told me sooner. And so without further ado, let me dive right in. I, like Humphrey, had graduated from Harvard Business School. Um, we've spent a lot of time over Crossover, although I've taken classes over at MIT and I've worked with the MIT Communication Lab as well. But as is the case with us 
MBAs, recovering MBAs, we can hardly walk down the street without sharing a PowerPoint. And so I've got one prepared for you all. So without further ado, let me go ahead, share my screen, and let's dive in to tonight's content. As Humphrey had mentioned, the session tonight is on secrets on doing well in your professional career, based on my new book with Harvard Business Review called The Unspoken Rules. Now, we have such a large audience here today, and well, it would just be a shame to not hear from all of you about what you're thinking about, what you're struggling with. And so what I would like for all of you to do is to pull out your phone, aim your camera app at this QR code. I'm doing it right now myself. Or if you're on a computer or have your browser open, go on to pollev.com slash G-O-R-I-C-K. Once again, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M slash G-O-R-I-C-K. When you get onto that page, you will notice that it may ask you to accept cookies, click accept. If it asks for a name, feel free to click skip. All of the polls tonight are going to be completely anonymous. So I want you all to participate and participate with the confidence in knowing I'm not tracking where you are or who's saying what. For those of you who are with us on your desktop in Zoom, Moana from the MIT office has kindly shared that poll link in the chat. So go ahead, go in there, click it, and fill out the form. So I'm curious, and I, I jumped ahead here just because I'm curious as to how you all are thinking about your careers in general. So I asked you all, what's your primary professional goal right now? Is it to move up, move internally to a different department, move externally to another organization, step up in your current role, thrive, or survive? And I'm seeing here a resounding 50% of you, half of you are looking to get promoted, about 30 36, 40% of you are looking to step up in your role, perhaps get more recognition, take on more important responsibilities. And then a smaller fraction of you are looking to accomplish the other uh, categories. Super interesting to see this. As is the case with all the polls here tonight, I want you to take a look at this. And well, if at any point in time you find yourself wondering if you're alone, well, I hope that these polls will demonstrate to you that you're not alone that there are plenty of folks here in the MIT community who are living the same, the same situation as you or walking the same path as you. I have another poll slightly different from the first one, and it has to do with a topic that I've been thinking about more and more as it relates to representation, especially within the Asian community. I'm curious, as you think about the next job that you choose to take or the next team that you choose to join, and let's say you're on the job website or you're on the website of the leadership team and you're going onto LinkedIn and you're trying to understand who you will be working with in the future. I'm curious, if you looked at your future team and you discovered that there aren't that many people, in fact, nobody on the team who shares in your identity, whether it's based on race, sex, sexual orientation, cultural upbringing, educational background, veteran status, all the different dimensions that we can define under the word identity, if no one ends up having that same identity as you, how much more or less likely are you to want to join that team? And I'm seeing here that, well, approximately 40% of you are saying actually that this would make an influence. This would make an impact on what you choose to do next. This is super interesting. I have one more poll related to this one. But it has to do with, well, you're now on the leadership page of this company. Maybe you're looking at the board of directors. You're staring at the leadership team and it doesn't seem like, and you're reading the bios and you're not seeing anyone who shares a certain background as you. I'm curious, how much more or less likely are you to want to join this organization knowing that, well, folks on the leadership team haven't necessarily walked in your shoes before? And again, identity can be defined in so many different ways, as we'll talk about in the session. I'm seeing here that actually even more of you, about 40, 50% of you are saying that this actually matters a great deal. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to a open-ended question now. Why is it that, well, this representation piece is so important to you? Why is it that this might either 
influence your decision in a positive way or influence your decision in a negative way? Curious, I'd love to just hear from a few of you on why it is that knowing that there's someone who is on the team or in the leadership team who identifies with you is something that's important to you. I'm seeing here one of our friends saying that it's going to be difficult to get a sponsor. And perhaps that is leading you to question your promotability in this organization. It impacts whether you want to be that person. It may influence your perceptions towards collaboration. Representation, if no one is there, it is important for me to be on the leadership team. It's hard to fit in if everyone is different. There may be biases against me. It's stressful working in a place without an identity. And I'm not sure if I can be authentic at work, knowing that, well, I'm not sure that there's someone who will, who will, who will understand. Finding advocacy. Cultural background and compatibility are so important at the senior leadership level. Knowing that someone ahead of me may be advocating for me is important. And knowing that there may not be any biases or there's a lower likelihood of biases may be important as well. Now, why did I ask this question? Well, actually, I want to read this one here. It's a former first-gen MIT student who's now a college professor married to an immigrant. I know firsthand the benefits of working in a group where people have different backgrounds and perspectives. I see it as an opportunity to learn. Now, why I asked you why you answered your prior poll in the way that you did, but I also want to share with you a little bit of the why as to why I'm so passionate about this work in the first place. Well, I've, I've uh, increasingly started to unpack this topic of representation. And we know that in corporate America, that Asians may be, over, may be well represented at the junior ranks, especially in fields such as technology and the financial industry. But as you work up your way to the top, there is much less representation. And there are many hidden obstacles that lead to some people struggling and not knowing why, and others thriving and having that wind at their backs. And so I want you all to know that, well, it's not a level playing field. And I also want you to know that your presence, especially in the halls of corporate America and large institutions in the US and around the world is important, that just seeing you representing the first gen identity, representing immigrants everywhere, well, that becomes really important for those who are coming after you, those current MIT students, those future MIT students who can't be what they can't see. And hopefully you can be that person to light the path for them. Now, I explained a little bit around the why, and well, it's this. It's that my goal in this session is to give you the tools really quickly to help you reach your career goals. And why me? Well, I was in your shoes and I've made it my life's work to help others in our shoes get further, faster in their careers. And to Humphrey's point, to make fewer of the same mistakes and to make, well, mistakes that haven't been made before. Now, Humphrey was and, and Win King were so generous in sharing my professional background with you. And if you were to go onto LinkedIn, and I encourage all of you to connect with me, you'll see that I graduated from Harvard. Forgive me. I started my career off in financial services, became a management consultant, became, uh, went back to Cambridge to get my MBA, wrote a book, and now am on the faculty at the University of California, Berkeley. But this is what you see on LinkedIn. What you don't see, however, is this. I'm the proud son of a working class single mother who left school when she was 12 years old to work in a sewing machine factory. And so when I walked down the streets of Cambridge and onto the Harvard campus, it was the first time that I was in the presence of people who could call their family members, professors, lawyers, doctors, engineers, executives, senators. And I just noticed that they, as a result of the, the informal education that they had growing up, were navigating the system in a very different way. And I noticed this exacerbate once I entered into the halls of corporate America, where I remember still setting up my laptop at my desk and already noticing that the colleague next to me who had started at the same time had already built relationships with some of the senior ranking members of the firm. Fast forward, and this individual ended up getting pulled into high profile meetings, high profile assignments that weren't publicly advertised. And whereas the rest of us were waiting for that next assignment to come, this colleague of mine had navigated her way to, well, becoming visible rather than invisible. And this came to the forefront, this invisibility that I was experiencing 
when I got my performance evaluations. My first one came along and it said, Gork needs to own his work. I don't know if you all have heard of this word ownership, but I heard it day in, day out as something that I was missing. The challenge was no one ever told me what it meant to take ownership. Fast forward several months and my second performance evaluation came along and it said that Gork should build deeper relationships with clients and team members. As someone who saw my mom go to work, put her head down, do the work and come home, I thought, well, doing my job is my job. What was I missing? What did it mean to build deeper relationships? My third performance evaluation came along and it said Gork should be a deep, a bigger voice in meetings. What did it mean to have a bigger voice, especially since when I showed up, I thought, well, this is someone else's show. These are someone else's clients. They know more than I do. I'm the most junior person. I don't have as much context. I should just show up, smile and nod, take notes and leave. And then the fourth one came along. And for those of you who are working in data heavy roles, well, turns out that when someone asks for a data export, they weren't just looking for a data export. They were looking for synthesis. They were looking for my point of view. And they were looking for it in a clear and concise way. But no one ever told me that clarity of communication was ever important. I thought, again, doing my job was my job. And it was these performance evaluations, one after the other, that led to me wondering, am I alone? And it was a singular question that led to me interviewing over 500 professionals across geographies, industries, and job types, including many MIT alums at both the undergraduate level as well as from the grad schools, to understand, hey, what are the things that school never teaches us, but that the real world expects of us? And so I'm curious now, for those of you who are on the Poll EV platform, go ahead and type in, what was your biggest area for improvement? in your most recent performance evaluation. And for those of you who are just joining us now, go on to pollev.com slash G-O-R-I-C-K. Again, in your most recent performance evaluation, what was your biggest area for improvement? What did others say that you were missing? And selfishly here tonight, love to see if I'm alone. And from the responses I'm already receiving, Seems like, well, seems like there, there, there are individuals here with us tonight who have received something very similar to communicate, to better manage relationships, to communicate with less technical detail, even though you might be in a technical role and working in a technical organization, that you need to be looking around corners, work more closely with key stakeholders, have a bigger voice, totally relatable, build relationships with senior management, be more assertive, have more presence. Build deeper relationships across the company to make data, to make a recommendation and to drive outcomes, to sell a bigger vision. Again, in no areas for improvement, do keep doing, we, we need to be learning from this individual here. And in, 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 in another way, another individual said, learning more and understand the matrix company structure to level yourself up, to network more. And well, I'll be honest, I interviewed over 500 professionals, but frankly, after just a few interviews, I started seeing responses that started rhyming with each other. And we're seeing that here tonight as well, that being a bigger voice, having presence, communicating, thinking more strategically, these are all topics that show up in our performance evaluation, but never in the classroom syllabus. Now, there is the self-help aspect of all of this where... There's an opportunity for us all to step up, but there's also an opportunity for the organizations that we work in to build a level playing field for all of us. Because the reality is the workplace very much isn't a level playing field. Where gender plays a role and the biases around gender, ethnicity, class, sex, sexual orientation, ability, disability, visible or invisible, diagnosed or undiagnosed, religion, age, language, nationality, vocal pitch, access to transportation, physical appearance, family commitments, if you're able to have the, the, the time luxury to be able to travel to a happy hour, to that seemingly optional but not so optional social event, introversion, extroversion, educational background, societal expectations. There are others as well, whether it's in the form of accent, whether it's, well, in my case, height, 
so many aspects of who we are can either set us apart in a positive way and end up leading to us getting ahead and others, well, maybe the subject of implicit biases and discrimination. So I don't want to even, even discount for a second that again, this may not be a level playing field. And Humphrey had mentioned this uh, earlier, and I think it's worth mentioning as well, that while the informal education that we may have received at home also plays a role, where my mom's lessons to me in a good-hearted way were to, well, put my head down, do the hard work, and let my hard work speak for itself, which may be reinforced by how we're taught in school, where the professor knows what's best, the answer is at the back of the textbook, and there's a right or wrong answer to everything. And then all of a sudden, there's what the real world expects, which is a world where, well, it's not the best ideas that get implemented. It's the person who sells the best. It's not the most competent people who get promoted necessarily. It's the people who are most visible. And so this Venn diagram ends up emerging and ends up holding some of us back. And what I realized from all of this as well, or in addition is, well, we're all navigating a wilderness expedition that is our careers. And there are certain things that we can do to set ourselves up for success in terms of working out, packing the right supplies, but there are also things that are outside of our control, whether it's the wind, whether there are bears along the trail. But in the face of all of these things that are outside of our control, there are also things that are within our control. And this is what I want to talk about today. How can you climb higher, faster, and more easily? I want to start off with a story of Esther, someone who I interviewed, and she was a software engineer in the Bay Area. She worked for a large technology company that we all know by name. She joined as a software engineer and then fast forward, got promoted to senior engineer in record time, at which point I immediately started wondering, well, how did she make it from here to here so seamlessly? To, well, me and to so many of her coworkers, it was a big black box until we started mapping out systematically what she did and in what sequence. First, she completed her assignments as a software engineer fully, accurately, and promptly. Now, I thought the interview was over when I spoke to her because I thought, well, that's all it takes, right? Again, coming back to that informal education that I'd grown up with. What I didn't realize, though, was that was just the first of many more steps. She one day had overheard her team members complaining. She was a software engineer within a pretty chaotic department where they were releasing new features all the time. And there was... Well, chaos, because people were releasing features. Sometimes they were incompatible with each other. Sometimes people were doing the same work and were stepping over each other's toes. And she started wondering, well, why is it that good people could be stumbling so much when we're all trying to achieve the same objectives? And so she, oh, just over casual coffee chats and lunches, she started just having one-on-one -on -one conversations with her coworkers to understand their pain points. And what she quickly realized was, well, it actually wasn't rocket science as to what was going on. There was just no feature release calendar. And so one single document that everyone could look at and update would, well, save a ton of people time and stress. The only issue was that people were looking down and not necessarily around. And so we're missing out on this bigger picture. And so she ended up getting the buy-in of her coworkers after thinking, duh, and then pitch her ideas first to her teammates and then to her manager. And at this point, she'd already build allies across the team, something we had talked about or something that I had seen from the poll just now. And so she didn't come across as if she knew everything. She wasn't coming across as if she was threatening. She was just coming across as if she wanted to help. And so she got the buy-in of her manager, of her coworkers, and she led a successful rollout. Now, I'm oversimplifying here in Esther's journey because, well, success is not linear. We're all going to have good days and we're all going to have bad days. But the question becomes, how can you position yourself onto this path where despite all these ups and downs, you're accelerating your career, you're moving forward versus this path? And so the question is, well, what did Esther understand that others did not? And this comes down to a mistake, a mistake in my mindset that I come into the workforce with. What I used to think and what I often hear is that it's all about doing your job well. Put your head down, do the hard work, and let your hard work speak for itself. 
what I now think and what I now believe and what I want you all to remember is, yes, it's all about doing your job well. That's important. But that's just a, just the ticket for admission. You also need to demonstrate that you can be trusted with more important responsibilities. And so, well, you got to do all of this without overstepping. There is a framework that is often used in large companies and small. In the large companies, this is actually the formal process. In smaller companies, people may not have such a formal process, especially if you're working at a startup, but you can be sure that in the eyes of senior management, they're probably thinking about these two dimensions. The two dimensions of performance, which is code for how reliable you are, and then potential, which is code for how promotable you are. And the idea behind showing high performance is through a framework that I call the three C's. It's actually the first chapter of my book, where the idea is the minute you show up, whether it's at a coffee chat, in an email, at an all hands, in a client meeting, is the instant that people start sizing you up and they start asking themselves, are you competent? As in, do you push things over the finish line and report back and say, mission accomplished? Are you committed? As in, are you excited to learn and grow and to develop and to contribute to our team? As in, well, are you eager to improve? And are you eager to help? And then finally, it's compatibility. Do you get along with us? In consulting, we used to call this the airport test of, well, if I got trapped in an airport, would I want to sit beside you? This is a piece that is ridden with biases and discrimination. But one of the ways that we can demonstrate compatibility is by wanting to, well, learn more about our coworkers, to build those relationships, and to ultimately want to improve ourselves. Once you show competence, commitment, and compatibility, the three Cs, well, you'll build trust, you'll unlock opportunity, and you'll leave people thinking, I trust this person, and I like this person. But what I realized is, actually, these three Cs are necessary, but they're not sufficient for getting ahead, for getting promoted, which I know so many of you are interested in doing. You also need, in the case of Esther, to show that you're also ready for a promotion. And here I have an acronym that I call TRAC. T stands for thinking. Do you know why you're doing what you're doing? Or are you relying on other people to be thinking on your behalf? Are you responding? Are you coming to the table with an answer or with a point of view? Are you anticipating questions? And in the words of one of our friends earlier, are you looking around corners? Are you addressing issues or flagging issues before they arise? Are you contributing to the conversation? Or are you, in the words of a law firm partner I interviewed, are you a wallflower? Are you offering ways to make things better? And super important and totally undervalued, are you known? Are you seen and heard by leadership? The reality is if someone were to look for someone to become general manager, they're unlikely to, well, dig through all the Excel spreadsheets and data exports and ask, well, who maintained our data the best and who kept the most accurate records? More likely, they're going to look left, look right, and ask, well, who do I know and who do I trust? Staying on track gets you there. And it leaves other people thinking, wow, this person could run this place one day. And that's where I know all of you have the potential to be as well. Because, and this is regardless of what role you have, because, well, when you start off in any role, you start off doing the execution jobs. So if as a software engineer, you can be sure that as an entry-level software engineer, you're coding. But you can be sure as well that the VP of engineering, the general manager, they're unlikely to be putting their fingers on the keyboard. They're going from coding to managing. and they're going a step beyond that to managing clients, attracting resources, selling themselves, selling their ideas, selling their department. And so the more you rise up the ranks, the more you go from doing the job to being a salesperson for the work. Showing potential means really embodying the mindset of someone who can sell. And what is really important to think about is how it's not sufficient to simply show performance because people will just very likely keep you in your role and see you as someone who's forever going to be there versus you as being a future leader, someone who's ready and capable and deserving of more important responsibilities. And there's a business case around why you should be running the show. And so your goal is to be here, the top right-hand corner of this matrix versus down here. 
But it's important to also start here to show reliability first before moving here. Otherwise, you'll overshoot the mark and come across as a know-it-all, and that can often backfire. So what is it going to take to show reliability and promotability? Well, two steps. The first is to reframe your role. And the second is to lead no matter where you are. So let's talk about reframing your role. A, top, a term that I have heard a lot and that I am very guilty of using is the word just. I just do project management versus my mandate. Yeah, it might be project management and maybe my title is project manager, but my broader mandate is to make sure that things get done. And as part of this broader mandate, I'm actually exposed to data and people and systems and processes that allow me to understand how all the pieces fit together better than anybody. In fact, I might know how things fit together better than the CEO because, well, I see how all the pieces fit together. Or the, the, the piece of feedback that I had received of, don't just do data dumps. Well, I thought of my role as being one of just doing data exports versus me uncovering insights that make people go, wow, really? And as a result of me being so close to this data, I understand if and how things work better than anybody. And this was really important because I had a difficult conversation with my manager one day. He pulled me aside and I thought I was getting fired. And he said, Gorik, you need to stop following instructions and only following instructions so closely. And he went on to say, well, in this age of automation, if all we needed was a data exporter, your job probably could have been automated by now. The reason why we hired a living, breathing human being like you is, well, you have a point of view. You can think. So, Gorik, start thinking. Again, it was a scary conversation. I thought I was getting fired, but it, in retrospect, it was one of the most important conversations I could have ever had because it flipped a switch in my head that my mindset of reacting, the mindset of putting my head down, doing the problem set, getting the right answer, and then submitting it was not going to be enough. Or if, for those of you who are not in technical roles, but are in a more writing-oriented role, you might be, for example, writing a blog for your startup or your, web, or your, your, your company's website or writing white papers, in which case it's easy to say, I just write articles versus I sell ideas. And as a result of selling ideas, whether it's in an academic journal or in a trade publication or in the media or on social media, is you understand how to make the complicated simple better than anybody. And in fact, that is why you were hired into this role. You know something others don't about simplifying ideas and communicating. So now what? Okay, what I want you all to do, I hope you're doing this even as, you're, as we're going through this content, is think about your role. Think about the tasks you are assigned. And then think about the goals that you're expected to achieve. What I see among those who show reliability and more importantly, promotability, is they think not in terms of tasks, but they think in terms of goals. I didn't just get hired here to finish a few tasks. I was here to accomplish the goal and to help the company or the organization achieve its goals. But once you've flipped the switch on thinking about, well, the importance of you and your role more broadly, then it's a matter of leading no matter where you find yourself. And this means flipping the switch from simply executing something we just talked about to strategizing or even selling. From going from asking questions or maybe not asking questions at all to suggesting ideas, going from gathering information and tossing it over the fence for someone else to interpret and to take all the credit for to synthesizing, going from following in meetings and expecting it to be someone else's show to steering the conversation or at least contributing to the conversation. And I call this level seven ownership. So there are four scenarios that we'll all find ourselves in day in, day out at work. You'll be well, tasked with a project, you'll have questions that will come up, you'll be researching topics, and you'll be in meetings. If you're in a white-collar work environment, you'll probably be finding yourself in 
any one, if not all four of these scenarios on a daily basis. The question is, how can you navigate this in a way that is more visible and that is more impactful? And here I will graph it out in a Y and an X axis. Let's talk about what it looks like when you're tasked with a project. Well, level one is to dismiss, and I know that all of you in even signing up for this career development program know that you're not in this level one category, but we all know people who are in that category of, yeah, this is not my job. This is someone else's responsibility. Where many of us find ourselves though is in the smiling and nodding mode of assuming that someone else has done all the thinking and all I have to do is blindly instruct, blindly follow instructions. Some of us will elevate ourselves up to the clarification level where we'll ask about not just what's been given, but what hasn't been given. But far fewer will bring ourselves to level four, which is to start contemplating, where we say, I'd love to see how I can help, but can you help me understand this? And okay, that makes sense, but what about this given the goal that we're trying to accomplish? And it takes an even more special person to be clarifying, contemplating, and then suggesting to do all of the above and then to say, well, would it be helpful if we tried this as well? This is where we're starting to get into what Esther did. Level six is where Esther was also proposing. So she was doing all the above and then said, sounds great. I can go ahead and set up one-on-one -on -one meetings or I can draft a proposal. How does that sound? And then level seven is where you're doing all the above and then managing the process, which Esther also did. And she did all the above and then said, great. I think as a first step, I'm going to talk to so-and-so. I don't think I've introduced myself to them yet. Would it be worthwhile for me to email them directly, send them a Slack message, or would you like to make an introduction? Essentially, the curve that you're writing up is the curve of going from executing to strategizing. And what you're doing is they are asking yourself, why? Why is this even asked to be in the first place? Oftentimes, the higher-ups haven't even thought about it, and they're asking you or expecting you to think on their behalf. Let's talk about when you have questions. The first step is to do what I did and to just Assume that if things aren't clear, it's my fault. It took a long time, but I finally got there of even just asking open-ended questions of saying, I'm struggling with this. Can you help? But what I noticed was, well, if you want to ride up this curve, those higher performers, those higher potentials start offering options. They say, I should, I noticed this, should I do A or B? Some will even share their point of view and say, I noticed this, I was thinking of doing path A or B. I was thinking of B for all these different reasons. Am I thinking about this the right way? And then once you get up to a level where you've built enough trust, you might even share a default where you say, I propose this, let me know if you feel differently. So you're giving people an option to say yes and no to, which is in contrast to the earlier levels where you're expecting others to think on your behalf. Level six, this is where you've built so much trust with your team that you're saying, I'm going to go ahead and send this email by 5 p.m. today. Let me know if you feel differently before I send this off. And then once you get to the senior levels, well, people might not even ask for permission. They might beg for forgiveness. And they're only sharing material updates. They're saying, I just want to let you know that I've gone ahead and done this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Level five will probably already do you very well. And it takes a special amount of trust to get to level seven. The key here, though, is to ask yourself, what would I do in the situation if I didn't have anyone else, one else to go to? And in retrospect, I think I spent far too much time while relying on other people to think for me when really they were expecting me to be doing the thinking and to be doing the proposing and to be doing the managing. When you're researching something, let's say your manager comes up to you and says, hey, can you please look into this? Well, first of all, look into this is completely ambiguous. What does it mean to look into? What does it mean to do this? Well, some of us might end up giving up where I thought, well, I couldn't find the data. Sorry, come back empty handed. Others might do the job and do it well. So they say, here it is. Others, however, they give what people asked for and something that they didn't ask for, but they'll flag it and say, here it is. But I also found this that might be relevant. Those who level themselves up to level four will explain why others should care. What is the so what? This is a topic that I've heard a lot about from, from my professional services colleagues. The higher-ups will often ask, what is the so what? 
which is code for, well, why should I even care? Level five is to explain all of the above and then talk about the implications. So you're saying the implication is this might mean that we should shift our timeline. It might mean that we should focus our efforts elsewhere. And then level six, this is where things get really powerful because it might be the case that others may not have even diagnosed the problem correctly. It may be the case that they're assigning you work that actually isn't all that useful. So you're now approaching your team and saying, my understanding is that we're trying to answer the question of this, or we're trying to solve for this goal. Based on this, I found this. The implication is this. Let me know if there's anything I'm missing. And then, well, level seven is where you're proposing a next step. So you're not just letting someone else take the credit for what you should do next. You're saying all of these things and you're saying, would it be helpful for me to do this? In other words, you're going from gathering information to synthesizing information. And you're asking yourself, so what? My goal here isn't just to show up and do the work. I'm here to accomplish some goal. What is that goal? And how is what I'm doing helping us achieve that goal? And the final one is on meetings where many of us, myself in particular, are staying quiet, assuming that this is someone else's show. Or if someone looks over to me and says, hey, Gork, we haven't heard from you in a while. What do you think? And I say, well, that's interesting. Or I agree, which doesn't really demonstrate much except for that I'm acquiescing to the conversation and to those around me. Instead, what I could have done is I could have justified, I could have said, this is what I think. What I could have also done is I could have critiqued, not just agree with everything that's been said, but to share what hasn't been shared or critique what may not be feasible. Level five is where I could have done all of the above and then also explain myself. Level six is where I start proposing a next step. It's not good enough to simply show up, poo-poo over all of others' ideas, but then expect others to pick up the pieces. It takes a special discerning eye to say, have we considered this? And I've heard this from a lot of senior leaders where they say the highest performers, the highest potentials always show up with maybe not solutions instead of just problems, but at least a proposal, at least a point of view. And level six gets you there. And then level seven is where you're also following up, where maybe after the meeting, you're saying, hey, just wanted to follow up about this conversation. Let me know if it'd be helpful for me to get in touch with so-and-so. So in other words, you're going from following other people's conversations to steering the conversation, or at least contributing to the conversation. And you're asking yourself, what's my point of view? Because that's ultimately what you were hired for, even if no one ever tells you. And so again, what you're doing is you're going from executing on others' instructions to strategizing and having a seat at the table. You're going from asking questions to suggesting next steps. You're going from gathering information and tossing it over the fence to synthesizing this information. And you're going from following other people's discussions to contributing and maybe even steering the conversation. Now, I've thrown a lot at you tonight. And there may be instances where you're thinking to yourself, oh man, if I had only navigated this particular meeting differently, my fortunes would have turned out differently. Well, I want to share with you, not my quote, but it's still my favorite quote. And it's the age old Chinese proverb, which is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. There are going to be all of these situations that you wish you had navigated differently. And well, tonight I've also presented to you a whole range of topics that you could be thinking about and hopefully applying starting tomorrow. And as is the case with planting a tree, these aren't going to be steps that you'll see the results of overnight. It may take weeks, it may take months, it may take years. But over the course of planting these seeds successively and being delivered about it, you will eventually look back and see an entire forest of opportunities that you've just sown for yourself. And so, what seeds will you plant? I'm curious, what's one thing that you plan to do differently starting tomorrow? Is there just even one thing from tonight's session that speaks to you that you may want to attempt? And one of my favorite, one of my favorite next steps coming out of any of these types of sessions is to pull out a sticky note, take out a pen and write down one thing that I'll then post on my laptop right beside my trackpad or up on my bathroom mirror. So that's the one thing that I'll focus on for the next week, for the next day. I'm curious if any of you have thoughts or ideas on what you plan to be um, 
doing and thinking and trying tomorrow. I'm seeing here one of um, our community members saying that they're looking forward to being more proactive about anticipating issues. Hopefully that's coming from the person who was asked to look around corners. Another individual said that they're going to go from executing to strategizing, going from being invisible in meetings to expressing one idea per meeting. Um, I actually have a mental rule where I, I try to show up with at least one sharp question and one sharp opinion. And sometimes it takes a little bit of legwork and oftentimes I won't even get a chance to share it because the conversation will go another way. But even just going in, having a point of view or having a question can set me apart. Willingness to take risks and saying something stupid in meetings. One thing that I found helpful in that situation is to not just try to speak up in meetings, but to build allies one-on-one. -on -one. It may be really difficult and nerve wracking to be speaking before a group of 10 people. It's going to be a lot less nerve wracking if you speak to at least one person within your network within your meetings, builds buy-in in the same way that Esther did. Her idea was unlikely to have succeeded if she had went into her meetings proposing it for the first time. She was only successful because she had met one-on-one -on -one with each person. And by the way, that's how laws in Congress work. It's unlikely that a bill would get passed if it's proposed for the first time without any consultation. The most successful policymakers build those relationships behind the scenes. And that's what well, it turns out that even in the private sector or in the not-for-profit sector, that's how things work as well. And so I know we're running short on time. I have a lot more resources that I would love to share with you all. And so for those of you who are interested, please give me some feedback on how I can improve and what topics you'd like to cover in future sessions. You can go back onto that polyv.com slash Gorick page. Out will pop a quick survey for you to fill out. If you want some more resources, please fill in your email. I'll send them right to you. And if even a fraction of what I share tonight resonates with you, please consider telling a friend or colleague, checking out my book, signing up for my email list, and checking out some of my corporate speaking engagements, and then, of course, connecting with me on social media. But with that, I just wanted to thank you all for your engagement. Thank you all for interacting with me, despite us only being here in two dimensions. And with that, I wanted to pass it back to Humphrey and to open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks very much. And so, you know, one of the things that uh, when I when I you know, read through your book, I was thinking through, it's like you had learning mode and then you had leading mode. And then there's a lot of people that are just stuck in workhorse mode and, you know, trying to figure out how do I go from workhorse mode into leading mode? Because if you've just been like working so well and people love what you're doing, you can just be stuck forever, right? And in that case, it's it's paying the bills, but it's almost like you can easily get stuck in a rut and many, many years pass. So how, how do you recommend someone flip that switch or do they need to switch to a new company, a new role? Because you know sometimes people just lose track of time. Yeah, it's such a good point, Humphrey. Um, I, I want to provide a bit of context around the learner mode versus leader mode. It's one of my favorite frameworks in the book. And, and the idea is the minute, well, you, you show up anywhere, and this includes the CEO of the company, everyone is in one of two modes in every setting. You're either in learner mode or leader mode. When you're in learner mode, people assume that you're new to the team, new to a project. So you either don't know very much or you shouldn't know very much. So you should keep your mouth shut, take notes, and ask questions. And if you propose too many ideas too soon, you come across as if, well, you're taking over someone's job, you're over eager, uh, you're over stretching and you're making others look bad or just full of yourself. And that's an instance where you show, well, too much leader mode when you're still in the eyes of others in learner mode. But over time, as you're the one to join these meetings, as the one to do this data crunching, to do this analysis, others are gonna start thinking, well, you were in that meeting. Well, you did that data export. You have that login to this to this server. You, you should know more about this than anybody. In fact, why are you not leading the meeting? And if you are in the eyes of others in leader mode and you're staying quiet, people will assume that, well, is it because you're not engaged? Is it because you don't care very much? Is it because you don't know what you're talking about? And so in my book, I say, you know, it's important to know if you're in learner mode or leader mode. And Humphrey, you added such a great third middle ground step, which is maybe sometimes you don't even get a chance to be seen as a leader. 
or a learner because you got stuck in the trap of being a workhorse. And that's where, well, people just expect that you're going to be the person to go to to get things done. People are not going to come to you to present to clients. I mean, I've faced this myself where you know, perhaps because of biases and, and, and so on, that I was perceived as the one who would be the Excel wizard, the data crunching wizard, even though I'm actually awful at, at math and, and, and Excel analysis. Um, and so for me, it took a while and I did a couple of things. So one is I, this is not my concept, um, but it is a topic that you all can Google for. Organizational psychologists call it, <laughs> call it um, strategic incompetence. And that is, you should be careful about what you're really good at because, well, if you're always demonstrating that you're really good at the data crunching, what are people going to think? They're going to give you more data crunching roles. So for me, I really needed to volunteer to speak more in meetings. And it started off with speaking one-on-one -on -one with individuals, having people call on me, asking if I could, it would be helpful for me to present a status update. And so I went from invisible to visible and it took some time. I did also switch teams. And so it's hard to break patterns of behavior if people start assuming that, well, whenever we have a particular piece of work, it should always go to you. And so sometimes it really does come down to switching teams so you can start from scratch, but everyone's going to have a slightly different situation, whether you should stay or leave is a longer conversation. Yeah. And I think that is one of those things that people have to be aware of you. Uh, if you develop an impression and everyone thinks that for a long time, it's pretty hard to change that impression, right? And so at that point, it's become too predictable and uh, it, it suddenly becomes out of character if someone suddenly like does this drastic transformation and they're already thinking of you in one role or one mode. And then you're now kind of like going outside and, and that it, it actually can be shocking and it doesn't, it doesn't always work if it, if it's gone on for too long. Right. So, unfortunately, um, so I've got a question here that I'm going to take from the audience from Shinjin Zhao said, thanks, Gorik. Excellent talk about taking ownership. Uh, thanks for sharing. I wonder if you have some comments about what specific Asian cultural values are most likely to become barriers for career advancement in the corporate world. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I think a lot of it has to do with speaking only when invited to speak. Um, oftentimes, well, the meeting goes, goes down a path that is determined by the most confident, the fastest reacting, the loudest talking person. And so when I was first starting out, and I noticed this among a lot of my Asian coworkers as well, which is that we adhere to the agenda and we assume that someone else has already decided how the meeting should run. And then within the first 30 seconds, someone derails the conversation and it goes in a totally different direction. And I assume that, well, actually, this is someone else's show, coming back to that phrase. Right. I, I think that's the, the main one. This also has to do with respecting hierarchy, where we assume that the most senior person is the only one who's permitted to speak. We assume that the most experienced person has the floor all the time. What we don't realize, what I didn't realize, was that if I'm in a small team setting and everyone near or at my level is speaking, that's actually an invitation that I should be speaking as well. Very different if you're in a highly hierarchical organization. I've been in meetings before where you have the CEO and the CFO and everyone else is just staying on mute. Those are the rare occasions when you're actually supposed to stay quiet in many other settings, especially if your coworkers are speaking up, you should be speaking up. And this is regardless of your age, your seniority. If other people are doing it, you should be doing it too. Yeah, totally. Um, I've got another question from Ren. Love the three circles you showed. Moving from the first two circles to a distant third circle takes not only effort, but also mental energy. It can be energy draining to go there and sometimes feels inauthentic, not being myself. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, I think this is a big limitation of my work, unfortunately. And this is a topic that I'm now working on, which is how do we go from self-help navigating all of these big questions ourselves to we all need to help. And this is where, well, you need to find a place where managers expect or are, are trained and have the mindset of, 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 of leading not just more inclusive meetings, but more productive meetings that don't get bulldozed over by the loudest talking, longest rambling person. So for, for a situation like this, I think one is think about what are the limits of your own capacity, capability, and willingness. So 
you know, maybe the extent of your comfort is in speaking with folks one-on-one. -on -one. And you can make a lot of impact by, that way, by the way, in building allies behind the scenes. You can be largely quiet in a meeting if everyone else knows that you've got good ideas and, and, and you're sharing them before or after meetings and you're building those relationships. It may be the case that, well, um, you are more suited for a certain type of role than others. There are going to be certain roles in an organization that are going to be more salesy than others. And then at an organizational level, it's helpful to think about, well, what organization actually is more conducive to your working style? I mean, uh, not all organizations are going to operate the same way. I would ask about who are, what are organizations that are led by senior management teams that have more of an inclusive mindset? And I would consider joining those organizations. Um, I, I, I think sometimes it, we can be really hard on ourselves to think that, well, if I can't thrive in this environment, there's something wrong with me when really there's probably something wrong with the organization. So I'd consider that as well. Uh, yeah, well, I think the other thing to, to be mindful of is that when you're developing a new muscle or a new skill, it's always uncomfortable, right? And so when you actually feel uncomfortable, you're actually learning and developing a new muscle. And that new muscle takes practice before it becomes comfortable, right? And so uh, in a way, the the fact that someone is going, feeling comfortable is actually uncomfortable is a good thing because the more times they do it, the more familiar it gets, and then it will no longer be an uncomfortable or in, inauthentic. It's just something that hadn't been done before that needs to get done. And so another example related to another question that someone has asked already, it's like, hey, if you're just going from executing, how do you flip a switch and go into strategizing, right? Because some people have categorized, you know, strategizing as like overly political and written that off as like not being a valuable thing to have. And then over many years have passed and you're realizing, hey, it's not political, it's actually strategizing. And if you're not strategizing, it's easy to be outmaneuvered, right? Because you'd be like, whoa, how did that just happen? And it's because someone else was playing chess and you were playing backgammon, right? And okay. it's like, we're checkers. So yeah, that's, that's um, so true. Let me ask and, another question. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, uh, no, I just um, wanted to reiterate that that, that is so on point. Um, I, I heard actually from an MIT alum, funny enough, that everything we learn about networking, we learn in kindergarten. And I think it's true. I think oftentimes people have a way of making something simple, scary. When we've all had the experience of going onto a playground, not knowing a soul and building friends and staying in touch with them, that's the same thing as networking in the professional workplace. It's just someone somewhere decided to call it networking and it scared all of us. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, at MIT, Sloan was court. 15 and sometimes people will just be like oh that's marketing stuff it's all fluffy and at work though if you're not marketing yourself then you're actually not necessarily getting recognized and so in that case that that also can backfire if you have a a, a mindset that says like the hard stuff is the most valuable stuff and diminish the the fact that you actually do need to to represent uh what you're doing and have everybody feel it and and believe it so now, now there's like a sensitive topic here uh, from an anonymous attendee. What do you think if your boss is quiet firing you, leaving you out of important meetings and projects and giving them to another newly favorite coworker, reducing your responsibilities and job functions in your job description and hiring others to make you redundant? I don't know if there's a, opinions or recommendations in that kind of setting. Yeah, I think in, in, in a situation like that, which... I, I've, I've seen and heard, and actually I'm thinking back to situations where it's happened to me. Um, you know, I, I think in, in the first instance, it's really easy to blame oneself that, oh my goodness, I messed this up. It's all my fault. When there may be a situation here where this manager is being unfair, is playing favorites. And it raises the question of, is this a manager that you can see yourself growing a career with and who's going to be banging on the table for your promotion in the future? And depending on the organization that you work in, this person might be the person to write your performance evaluation. They might be the person to determine what next role you should get. And so what I would start diagnosing here is will you be successful working with this manager? And if the answer is no, it might be time to find a manager who really is in support of your career. 
Um, but but Humphrey, you've seen you've probably seen this a lot in organizations large and small. I'm curious if you have a point of view on this. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's like by the time that a quiet firing is occurring, the relationship is not it's already damaged. It's not like easy to correct. And just because you don't want to be you want to be in a better situation, it's already too late because the the things that have been done before that led to that already occurring have already occurred, right? And and so in that situation, it, you know, if that's happening, it's already too late, right? Um, uh, and and the the key is to have avoided that situation. And so if someone is not networking, someone has already been viewed as marginalized and not proactive enough, or, or and maybe too expensive for what they're contributing, and not you know potential and ignore a good example, then at that point, yeah, someone's already made the decision and, and it's not it's not going to be changeable just because you wish for it to be different, right? Um, so, um, you know, I think, you know, maybe there's one more question. I think people are asking for like, hey, you know, is there like a follow-up to the session or like some other ways that people can, you know, have this kind of, you know, dialogue? Um, and, I, you know, I don't know if there's resources that you can point people to because, you know, I can see there's way more questions than I can actually, you know, address here because we've, we've run out of time. <laughs> so I figure maybe we use that as the last question just so that the uh, people can feel not too frustrated if they have a whole bunch of other stuff they actually want to ask and, and get addressed. Yeah, no, I appreciate the the interest, everyone. This means a lot. Um, so, I mean, my, I'm I'm here to stay in in this field and this line of work. And so I am exploring um, why well, I am building additional resources. I'll be releasing a blog and uh, many other resources written and and in video form over the coming months. So if you're at all interested in that, please go onto my website, sign up for my email list or fill in the poll everywhere where you can share your email with me. I'd love to stay in touch. And um, I will also make a note of the questions that come in. And as I develop my ask me anything series, I'll be sure to highlight those questions and answer them in priority. Um, if you all have ideas on where I should be taking my work next, what other topics should I be researching and writing about and speaking about, please let me know. Um, this work could not have happened without it being a huge crowdsourced effort. And so let's co-create this together. Please stay in touch. Please reach out to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the one other thing I'll add is, you know, within the MIT Chinese alumni group, um, you know, within the whole alumni network, anyone who is in your field and further along in your career, you should reach out to the fellow MIT alumni because anyone who is, you know, older than you by default has more experience and you should actually seek out mentors because, you know, in, in my day, I didn't have many other Asian mentors to ask because, you know, like, I could have caught asked anybody, but people tend to feel a little more comfortable with you know similar background people. And now there's actually a pretty healthy amount of alumni in you know senior places, and 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 you can you should you shouldn't be shy, right? Because if you don't ask, you're not going to learn. Um, and you know the whole reason that we have our alumni group and the reason that Gorak wrote this book is that we want to teach everyone uh, our experiences. Uh, and so I think you should tap into the alumni in addition to uh, expert resources. Uh, and so with that, let me hand this back now to to, to Winking, our president uh, at the Chinese Alumni Group. Thank you so much to both of you, Garik and Humphrey. Garik, you're fantastic. I love your presentation and your action plan. And Humphrey, you guys are just dynamic. The, the two of you dynamite, <laughs> bouncing back and forth. And Humphrey, you're bringing in you know, your wealth of information and experience being a serial entrepreneur. Thank you so much. And of course, you know, please join our group, MIT Chinese Alumni Group. Like Humphrey said, we are here to help one another. So please, you don't have to be Chinese and it's free. And our webinars, our online events are free and open to the public. We have them almost every month. And if you're a member of the public, you can uh, link in with me, message me to be added to our email invite list. So 
let's get together, mentor one another, you know, help one another. And before I forget, uh, we should thank the audience, of course. And of course, Garik again, Humphrey again. I'm just so excited. And we want to thank our sponsors, the MIT Club of New York, the uh, first generation alumni of MIT and the MIT Alumni Association. And please keep in touch like Gaurish said and Humphrey said, and we hope to see you in the future at our future webinars and online events. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.